we watch the Don Lemon Elon Musk interview so you don't have to. In fact, we're going to bring you content beneath it. It's not maybe immediately visible if you just sit down and watch it sequentially word for word. We're going to show you where Grace was missing and where it could be installed in this episode. Our world is lost in unnecessary fear and hurt. Our systems seem scientifically engineered to make you small, powerless, and always waiting for the next great leader who will fix the problems around us. Worse, we're witnessing neighbor versus neighbor while warfare breaks out around our family tables. But you have access to a spirit, a strength that enlarges and empowers you. Even better, you don't need to wait for the next big movement. You can heal the world. It's time for governance by Grace. Welcome to Grace Archie with Jim Babka. Sponsored by the Zero Aggression Project, zeroaggressionproject.org. Today we're going to do something we've never done before for this very special episode of Grace Archie. Uh, Jim, what have you got for me? Uh, we're going to do a reaction video, right? Yes, yes. The, I love these. Okay. One of my favorites, like, you know, guys listening <laughs> to music from the old days that they've never heard before and you, you, you watch them okay. react. It's really cool. So we're going to do right. some of that. Yes. We're going to do a little bit of that. And I have to say, I tend not to like these videos. I don't think they are done well, but they are popular yeah. and this is a current topic and it has a important grace component, which is that we are always advocating for the, uh, for free expression, free speech, free press free association. We're always advocating for those things, especially when you don't like what they're doing. We're saying that that people, the best possible thing that can happen is that people um, are able to speak. They do speak. We listen. We try to understand, even if we don't like it. We try to understand and work through things. And so that relationship goes much further. You're going to sort of teach us by example here. I audience. hope so. I don't know if I will, but I'm going to try. You'll do your best, right? <laughs> I'll do my best because I, I can't help it. I'm, 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 uh, I have been a political commentator for the last couple decades. I, I have a regular radio appearance that I make every week on another show, and I'm brought in. You know, just yesterday I was on talking about the the, the national debt, and and so I'm <laughs> talking about why we're in the situation we're in. I mean, this is what I normally. This is the normal thing, and there will be other shows that will react to the Don Lemon Elon Musk uh, interview. But they and they will do it from a political position. I want to try to do this not from from a political pundit position. I want to do this from what's really going on here, why it matters if we want to have a, a gracious society. That's where I hope I yes. end up today. Within I, our ethos of grace, uh, this is unique in terms of a reaction video because we're not we're not stirring the pot. We're not calling for additional conflict or coercion. We're not trying to make money off of a of a drummed up battle, right? Right. Right, We're and this, by the way, was this was a, a a very expensive, maybe the most expensive all time drummed up battle. So let me set the stage. Yeah, um, Don Lemon uh, was on CNN. He had a primetime show. The primetime show uh, ran its course, and he ended up uh, getting relegated to a morning show that he shared with two female hosts, at which he behaved badly. Uh, he was really rude to the other two women with which he was working. Uh, repeatedly. This was obvious to the audience that this was happening. It was quite bad. Uh, reports began leaking out about his behavior, which had been legendary and going on for years. And CNN ultimately f asked him to leave. He he went one step too far. Elon Musk, having taken over Twitter, has a deal with Tucker Carlson. It's a multi-million dollar deal, uh, tens of millions, frankly, uh, where Tucker is on uh, the platform as a featured prominent spokesperson who has a show. This is the very first one of its kind. Everybody was kind of surprised that that's where Tucker landed because he had all the options in the world available to him. And that's where he, he was, he was at. Uh, so he gives Don an offer that's worth more than $10 million to come and do a show allegedly to provide some ideological balance. They sat down Elon's show began, I'm sorry, uh, Don Lemon's show began and his very first interview, he decides to interview Elon Musk. And Don lasted one interview. Uh, Elon canceled them. 
Now, this is where it gets really interesting to me because within hours, Don is already on social media saying that Elon's mad at him. His uh, uh, He questions openly and outright Elon's bona fides on free speech, which will become ironic as we go through the track here. And the very next place he runs to tell his story is CNN. They broadcast clips from the interview pre-release, including one that I think this audience should find ungracious. The whole line of questioning, one particular piece of questioning that occurs in this, regardless of what you think of Elon, I I believe to be ungracious. And they feature that first. That's the very first part of the CNN clip. And I'll point that out to you when we come to that. Uh, And then Lemon's team threatens a lawsuit leaving a doubt to Stuer that a contract has been violated. Nobody knew this yet. It took hours for this to emerge. There was no signed agreement between these two gentlemen. It was a handshake agreement. Now, I want to put some things on the table right up front. I want to say I believe adversarial interviews are good. And I think people of power routinely get softball questions lobbed at them because the media wants to have access to them. So I would like to see adversarial interviews be more common. That was not what was done here. Don came in, as he did so many times on CNN, to grind an ideological axe, and he did it from a fairly haughty position. Um, And you know what? That's fine, too, if it's clear that's what you're going to do. And apparently that's going to be Don's brand, but Elon wasn't in on the bit. Um, And you'll see he's at pains in in various uh, points in this discussion to try to see the better side of it. Um, (laughs) If you're, um, well, let let me say this first. Let me say this first. First, I think that Don doesn't actually believe in free speech. And we're going to get into why I think that he thinks he's, but he claims he's pro free speech. So I felt that way too. He also makes the point that he's an independent centrist in the course of the discussion. And if you, if I'm saying something in any part of this is because I watched the entire thing, we are not going to play the entire thing today. We're going to play segmented segments and clips. So it's possible I will say something out loud that doesn't actually appear in one of the clips that we've identified to cover here today. Um, But he's trying very, very hard, in my humble opinion, to paint a picture of Elon as a bigot with zero nuance. He's an unrepentant, 100% complete bigot. He's anti-gay. He's anti-trans. He's anti black, he's anti-Hispanic, and he is really, 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 really anti-Semitic. That's what Don wants you to believe by the time he's done. The weight and time of the interview, the overwhelming weight of the time in the end of the interview focuses on Elon's bigotry. There's other things they get into, including one that I think was completely off limits, but this is where he was focused. And it was kind of a, when are you going to stop beating your wife type routine? And an inability to engage back, he is completely, you know, Don is as pure as the wind-driven snow, don't you know? He has no opinions whatsoever. Uh, he's just there asking questions. Um, but it's not true. It's, it's, it's not true. No. Um, it is obvious to me, some things are obvious to me, uh, that Don Lemon doesn't like or respect Elon as a human being. Which is not going to make for a good business relationship. So there's a lot of people asking the question out loud, and it's an obvious question. Why did Elon make an offer to to Don to bring him on? But I got to say, it's even more interesting to me. Why did Don agree to this? Okay. Because the next thing that he does by running the CNN, the way he structured this entire interview was designed to get himself canceled or cut. He was trying to get under Elon's skin. He was trying to do something. He was trying to, in my humble opinion, impress the old cadre of colleagues in his social circle at the job he no longer has. I don't know if you've ever watched one of these shows where they do pranks on people, Bill. This was a prank interview. 
the whole point was the reaction he was going to get out of Elon and he's trying to press a crowd. And he feels this so strongly. He loathes Elon so strongly. He thought it was a good career move to impress the gang back at CNN more than it was to keep a contract that was worth more than $10 million. He was stood to make over $10 million working with Elon. And he decided instead, I want to sabotage that and impress the people at my old job. Can you imagine going and getting a new job where you've been fired from the previous job and your whole goal is to show the other people how much you really wanted to work at the old company? It's backwards. It's completely strange. Now, this is a short-term play. He's got a lot of eyeballs on his initial episode with this stunt. But stunts, and I will tell people this from, we, we have not even begun yet our marketing efforts. We are trying to establish the product to some degree uh, here. And I do not believe in my heart of hearts. I believe, uh, let, me, let me say what I do believe. I believe I have a relationship with you. And I believe that what I have to have is that your confidence. And I need to be a confidant. I have to be somebody that you relate to when we're talking. Bill and I need to present a message that when you're done listening to, you feel a sense of hope. Now, that will not get us as no, um, the clicks we want. Each individual episode, we're going to have to suffer having fewer people watch the show in order for the people that we are trying to build a relationship with, you, to leave with a sense of hope. Almost everything that's being done in the uh, internet space is designed to touch your adrenaline, get it stoked. It's designed to, to rattle the vagus nerve. Almost all of it is designed to put your stomach in knots, leave you in perpetual fear. And it's funny because dopamine starts to react to this. And so people start to get addicted. They need the dopamine to keep coming back. And yep, the you, dopamine so, fix is a, re, is a response to the conflict machine. Right. So we could put on a show. Let me tell you, I know how to do it. Like I have understanding of how to put on a show where we put on headlines that are designed to hook you in a negative way about current events that are happening right now. And then turn that around on you and just scare the crap out of you or make you as mad as possible. Destroy your hope. And I know I'll be rewarded in that episode for doing that. I know that the individual view and listen count will skyrocket because I do it. We have avoided doing that. And even now, as we're picking a current topic out of the news headline and coming to you right now, rushing our episode out to do this, yes, we do hope that because of the names that are in it, you do watch. But I don't want to strike those nerves and get you stoked. I don't want that to happen. That's not what I want. I want you to come away understanding what actually happened here. I want you to come away empowered with a new piece of knowledge or a new sense of hope, or hopefully both. All right. So let's get into this prank interview. Let's do this. Yeah. Uh, let's start with clip A, if we could, please. Yes, after months of begging me, wooing me to offer some exclusive content on his platform, Elon Musk decided to scrap the deal. But our plan is, and always has been, to release this show everywhere, on YouTube, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, just about any place you stream content. Okay, so I, I, I just want to say right up front, it was always the plan. So did Don shake Elon's hand knowing he was going to do this from day one? Did he, was he planning in a way to, to basically bust this deal? Was he not, was he ever being honest with Elon at any point? It was always the plan, he says. I just, uh, please hear that clearly. It was always the plan. Elon begged me. It was always the plan. We were going to be everywhere Elon wanted an exclusive. Elon was offering an opportunity, trying to balance out the platform. He could have picked other people to do this. There's other characters out there. No. So I, I think this is this is really interesting because not only did he say he didn't want this, but as I already pointed out, he released a video. He went into a massive conflict PR campaign uh, with segments of the video to titillate people, to get them to watch it. And it's worked. And it got him out of his exclusive deal with, with Elon. And so I don't think, by the way, if he goes to court, I think this is one of the, if his lawyers go to court on a non-written agreement, which I doubt they're going to do, I think that was also part of the PR stroking. 
but let's assume they do. I think one of the weaknesses to the argument is he said out loud, I always plan to do this. I always plan to do this. No kidding. So the handshake deal, everything, it was all set up to stoke the PR machine. Yeah, he 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 took it because he thought, well, hey, here's an interesting way to start the show. And if he didn't do it at the day that he shook the hand, he knew he was doing it somewhere along the way. But it, it didn't just he didn't just decide to do it. He's got a set of blue cards in front of him. He's asking these questions. This yeah. was planned. He had total control of the interview. Um, Elon doesn't fig doesn't completely understand what's happening. He gets senses of it. And I'm, I swear I could see it happening. And then Don being a skillful interviewer, being experienced in media knows how to direct the conversation long enough to kind of delay what was happening. But when they got near the final, as you know, you watched it too. When they got to the last 10 minutes of that interview, Elon, it was clear Elon was done and Elon was letting him know. Uh, but the whole time Don drove the bus, it was his questions. Okay. Uh, let's do clip B. There are no conditions on this interview. You said that, you know, we'll speak to you for an hour. I don't like sound bites, so I welcome that. So let's get yeah. into it. So we're here in Austin, South by Southwest uh, is going on. We're at the Tesla headquarters. You are in the process of moving SpaceX here, I understand? No. Okay, put a pin in that idea. You're in the process of moving SpaceX. Before I say that, that graphic that's in the bottom corner of the screen, Okay, I think the bar, and I even want to talk to you about this, the bar that he's got going on there is beautiful. It's elegant. It's really effective. It's pretty. But that, you know, swirling, this looks like a morning show. And it completely does not agree with the brand, which is a, a, a level of, of uh, ugliness that's going to be in these things. And I, I, it's not social, it's not YouTube, Tubi, right? Uh, I, you know, we, I have this, you know, backdrop here. You have a backdrop. And, um, you know, we try to do this to kind of like set a mood for the show or whatever, but this is not a professional set and that's not how YouTube works. So, you know, one of the things that happened after this relationship terminates is Elon says out loud, or he writes in a tweet that Don tried to bring a CNN show to, uh, to, to YouTube and it's not going to work. Well, he's hundred percent right about that. We won't go into all the reasons. I mean, there's a lot that could be said about just that subject alone. We could do half a program on that, but <laughs> That I don't know. I just th th it's not even a CNN show. It's a morning show. It's like you know, it, like you expect to have laughs with people who are going to tell you how to you know how to how to save time on your morning commute. It's just I don't I don't like the graphic. You can see from the side angles too. By the way, there are a ton of there's a lot of equipment there and a lot of people. It's a big production team. Yeah, I think it's going to be hard to sustain all of this uh, long term for him. And I think this will be the beginning of the end of his show because when you start out at a certain level and then you degrade the quality instead of start at a certain level and improve the quality, uh, that's also a recipe for for failure. Once you start down, it ends up being you know uh, a landslide. Okay, uh, but <laughs> this question that he asks about SpaceX, I think it underscores the thesis that I have here about his behavior, what he was attempting to do because he wasn't prepared. He asked a question that he didn't know the answer to. It was an awkward start. The, you know, the question that matters the most in the interview, in an interview like this, is the first one you ask. The and question that matters about whether yeah. headquarters is moving to Austin. Yeah. And, and, and it turns out he's wrong. And I mean, even, even Elon's kind of stunned. Like, this is out of left field for him. Like, uh, okay, where did you get this news? Right. Or why does it matter? Is more. Or why did, yeah. I, I mean, if since it, since he didn't know where he gets it from, why does it matter? It's a weird place to start. And I think it was because he didn't want to get hung up on right away. He wanted to talk about some things, and you'll see this happen again, that Elon's interested in because Elon's starting to get concerned and agitated. Whew, we'll slide back into Elon's work, which is a subject he loves to discuss. But he's unprepared, and it's just he didn't care about his subject. This is a throwaway question, and it's so awful because he didn't know the answer to it. If you're doing an interview like this, you should have done your homework. And if you got this large production staff, did you have a development staff too? Was there some producer that was helping you assemble the questions? Well, fooey on them. They didn't do their job. Okay. All right. Before we play the clip C, I, I want to say, I want you to notice something called the awkward pause. This is an interview technique. And by the way, there are a lot of techniques being used in this thing. Like if you have a sense of what you're looking for, you can see them being played out. They're not hidden. They're not subtle. They're not done with the subtlety of a David Copperfield performing a magic trick. They are just overt. 
And one of them that's used here is the awkward pause. Because this clip goes on for more than a minute, almost a minute and a half. And so I want you to notice the awkward pause. I want you to notice how he's trying to leave Elon hanging out there a bit and pretending that he doesn't really have the answer to his question. So go ahead and hit clip C. And people can make their own decision about what, what they what they believe. You didn't mean that I'm on the left? Did you think that? I thought you were on the left, but yeah. I don't know. I'm used to, yeah. well, let's just say, I don't know what the left is or the right is, frankly, these days, because things can be quite polarized, but you seem... My impression was that you're, 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 you're more likely to be described as on the left than the right. Uh, my, my sense is you're sort of center left. I don't know. You tell me. Well, did you ever watch me on CNN or did you watch I saw me? Se I saw segments. Se yeah. I, yeah, not. I, I saw segments. Yeah. But CNN is generally considered left. Yeah. Why do you say that? What, why do I say CNN is generally considered left? Uh, I think if, if you look at any sort of media survey of what is on the left or right, I think they would say, like, for example, Fox is on the right and CNN is on the left. Yeah. So that's what... Is it, Am uh, I missing something here? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you missing something? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that when, you, when, when I read that, I said, like many uh, of my critics or detractors, they never really watched me on CNN. They just saw the clips of me either on social media or maybe on Fox News or a conservative media yeah. where it's sort of a, where I've become a character or a caricature of what I actually am and it's taken out of context. Uh, sure. So uh, what you see here, Bill, there's, th th he's, first off, he's completely blissfully unaware of his own, Don Lemon is, of his own politics. I, and I, 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 I prefer the explanation that he's unaware because the other one's worse. Um, he doesn't seem to know he's doing, he will play an MSNBC character, let alone a CNN character, uh, throughout this interview. And he's definitely trying to impress an elite left wing secularist class. And he doesn't want to acknowledge who he is. Um, and, and he tries to put this back on Elon, like some other Elon's the bad guy for this. Like you, have, you haven't watched my show. You don't know who I really am. <laughs> well, uh, gosh, I have, and I can tell you, this was there was nothing in this interview that was surprising behavior to me. I have watched On Lemon's show for years. I've seen it repeatedly. I've probably seen a hundred episodes of it, maybe more. I, 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 <laughs> I know exactly what we were looking at here. This is the same thing he did there uh, when he didn't like a guest, and when he didn't like a guest, it was very, very uncomfortable and awkward. And so that's what was going on here. I told you to stay tuned to the awkward pause. I hope you picked up on that, right? So I ask you a question, and then you answer, and then I sit there like this. Right. Dead air. Dead air. Dead air. But and it's what a tactic, it does, right? It's a tactic. So it's I, I, I'm a fan of uh, the work that Craig Ferguson did on The Late Show, okay? He's a comedian that had a show that was on after Letterman every night, uh, back in the day. And one of the things that he would do with each of his guests, he would give them an, an option as to how they wanted to end their interview with him. Uh, this is the way he closed it. And one of the options was called the awkward pause. And the two would just sit there and stay like one would say something or he would say something. And then the two would just sit there and stare at each other because it also creates discomfort for the audience. Yeah. And that's the bit. It's funny, right? They that's would just the kind of look at each other. Yeah. But that time it's funny. I'm telling you that every other time it's done in life and you could use this tactic in your own conversation. It works in private settings just as well, honestly, is you could just stop and stare at the person and be like, uh, uh huh. And the other side feels compelled to speak. Police use this in interrogation. They'll just wait, just wait Got you it. out Shut up. Yep. because there's something about this silence that makes everyone in the room uncomfortable. But if you know what you're doing, you're not as uncomfortable as everybody else. Because you already did it. You already planned it. And that's what he's doing. Okay. I want to get into a tiny bit of psychology here. I believe that Elon didn't know what was happening yet. Uh, do you know why we use, Bill, do you know why we call somebody a con man? What does the con stand for? Gosh, I never really thought about it. A confidence? Confidence. Confidence man. Okay. So yeah. the way a con works is that you you get trust out of another person. You yes. build trust. You also suck away time for decision-making. You create an urgent crisis 
that bonds the two of you together, and then you create immense trust. Yes. And if you're successful at appealing to somebody's empathy, their guard is down, and they're likely to do something they shouldn't have done. Now, you can also run the same thing on greed, but there's a version of this that runs on empathy, okay? So sometimes you can mix the two, but it's mostly empathy that you, you know, th this is a very, very common thing where you ask for some help. You know, I only need, like, I have 20 bucks to get here, whatever, and you do this thing. Um, it is normal when we're in conversation with other human beings to assume the best of the person with whom we're speaking, to be polite and civil. So sure. even if you knew, um, uh, even if you knew that someone was, uh, let's say you start to suspect, listen, I, you know, they're coming at me. You wouldn't do it right away. You would keep testing to find out what's happening to you. Sure. Of course you would. All right. So Don's aware of this in the course of the interview and he will come back and you'll see this, uh, momentarily. We, uh, we'll get to it. He will switch topics into something that Elon is more comfortable with. He will start relating to Elon again to keep the process going. But right now, he's in the beginning stages. This is one of the arguments he wants to start to construct here that um, tries to kind of make Elon uncomfortable, tries to show that Elon is really a right-wing zealot nut. And, um, but he's relying in these early stages on this initial reciprocity that we always give everyone in a conversation. Elon has no idea what's happening to him. Okay? I'm going to say one more thing here. The very end of this whole statement that he makes, where he says, you know, most people watch these clips and they get these, this figure of me. I believe that Don is saying out loud, I am offended that you think that I'm whatever. And we've had a handshake deal going on for darn near a year, getting ready for this moment now. But you offended me with a tweet that you put out, which he does end up sharing suggesting that uh, somebody like Matto or Lemon should be on his platform. You offended me by saying that I'm this thing. And I'm just now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to show you today how offended I am. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to destroy you. So we'll go on from there, but keep that thought in mind because it, it's, it's a subtle little thing that he lets slip out about, oh, people don't watch. There's no way. I mean, everybody in the planet, Don Lemon might be the only person that doesn't know that he's on the political left. <laughs> Let's go to clip D. The platform has kind of picked up where conservative media, some conservative media has left off, um, that moving to the right, increasingly becoming part of the conservative dialogue, sometimes even conspiracy theories, right? There was an article recently written about you saying that you, Donald Trump, and X were the most important um, people uh, or places or whatever icons when it comes to the MAGA movement. Do you agree with that? How do you feel about that? So <laughs> we just got through a clip. This is a few minutes later that this happens. And so you could miss this because you could get sucked up in what they're talking about. But this is just a few minutes later. Um, uh, it's less than two. It's just under two minutes later have gone by. Um, you know, we were all so young two minutes before, right? And and uh, he's saying, you pigeonholed me. And you know what he's doing here to Elon? He's pigeonholing him. So a pigeonhole for thee, but not for me. That's what's going on here. It's just that simple. Like he just did the behavior he said he was offended by. Okay, I, I promised I would show you how he gets Elon back in his camp when he's running Elon through some tough stuff, and Elon might be starting to get a little too agitated, right? So he 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 puts up a, a Tesla Roadster, which, by the way, this looks like it's a, a really beautiful car, really going to be exciting and fun to drive, uh, and 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 has now now I, I got to be honest with you, they're 13 minutes or so in the interview. You can see on the bottom of the screen, and Elon thinks the politics portion is over. <laughs> he thinks that, okay, we, I got through the rough patch. He was going to have to ask me some tough questions. Um, I weathered that. Uh, I didn't, it was unpleasant, but you know, we're on to things now that I want to talk about. We're going to start talking about Tesla and SpaceX and my other companies and what makes me tick and maybe my secrets to success or who knows where this is going to go. I mean, he, Don works for me. We're friends, right? Um, uh, but that's not what's happening here. And I want to refer back to Craig Ferguson again, because Craig Ferguson would 
uh, would do things on his show that were parodies of stuff that would go on. My son pointed this out to me, and I appreciate Steve for pointing this out. Uh, there were there were parodies of tactics that that Don's running here, and and uh, one of them was to see he would give people a question. They would have to ask answer a trivia question, and and uh, when he would begin the question, he would say, "Iceland is in the North Atlantic." Its capital is Reykjavik. How tall is Regis Philbin? So the idea would be that the the cadence of the thing was he would ask something completely irrelevant to set people up and then hit them with something. And I I found Musk expression for that. It's right here. He does it all the time, man. Right. That's the Uh, expression on that question. I I just want to make a proposal to Elon. Elon, if you're watching right now, okay, you should be. This is a good show. If you want to do better, uh, give Craig Ferguson a show. If this is, if you want awkward pauses, if you want completely unrelated questions, if you want people to leave with a sense of hope and joy, give Craig Ferguson a show instead. It would be a much better show. We miss him. So just give him a show instead. And then we can avoid uh, messy matters like this. In fact, my guess is when he brings you on and has some fun with you, you will leave laughing. So, uh, because a lot of people said that Elon has no sense of humor after this. That was a lot of people's take. He's a, a pampered billionaire who's used to everybody kissing his bottom. Eh, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I have to say, I, I this this was this was a smack to the bottom. This was not a kiss. And the idea that somehow that you always have to agree with or be nice to people in Elon's position, I don't believe Elon actually is that way. I think that's a character. Of, of who he is. I think he was able to handle the tough questions that happened in, up, up till now. Uh, I think he, he does okay with them, um, but not where we go next, not where we go next. So we're in a moment, we're going to bring up clip F bill, but I, I want to say the, this particular question that it's about to be asked and the depth with which it's pursued are ungracious. And this should not have been in the interview. And this was, should have this this moment here would have been enough for Elon to get up and walk away. This moment here, all by itself, would have been enough for Elon to get up and walk away. Elon could have chosen, by the way, he will object to the fact that this is done, but he could have chosen to end the line of questioning. But if people think he's thin skin, notice now that he actually answers the question. And there's an a, there's an obvious question to be asked about this next segment which is if Elon was the one to raise this question, this matter in the first place in a public setting on, on Twitter, on X, if he was the guy that did it first, why was it off limits to Don Lemon? Let's go ahead and play that clip. You've admitted that you've had, you have a ketamine prescription. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that for? Well, I mean, it's pretty private to ask somebody about a medical prescription, you know. Um, but uh, it's, I think it's, it's something I'd say, like, uh, th- there are times when I have um, sort of, uh, I don't know, a, like, a, like a negative chemical state in my, in my brain, uh, like depression, I guess, you know, is, or, or, or like depression that's not l- linked to any negative views. Um, and, and, and then uh, ketamine is helpful for uh, getting, getting one outside, out of a negative frame of mind. Well, listen, I, 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 in fact, I generally... Obviously, I'm not a doctor, but I would say uh, if someone has depression issues, they should consider talking to the doctor about ketamine instead of SSRIs. Listen, I, I think that um, ketamine uh, and drug therapy is uh, increasingly becoming more in the mainstream. Yeah. That wasn't bad. Okay. So let's back up then and, and cover why, what I previewed before the clip. First, let's be very clear. Elon is the one who has disclosed the fact that he has a ketamine and I'm going to say this word because it's important to a lot of people. I don't care about this word, but a lot of people do. He has a doctor's prescription. Okay. So for those of you who do the ungracious and completely unhelpful thing of believing that someone who is using a pharmaceutical product uh, needs a doctor's prescription, otherwise they're a bad person, he has handled that for you. He has a doctor's prescription for this. And Elon released it because he wanted to say that some people may find this helpful for themselves. He's found it helpful. 
We've all been in this position where something's changed our life in some way. We've discovered a new product, a new service, right? And it might even be something really personal that's made something better for us, right? If you lose a lot of weight, people will come and ask you how you did it because everybody kind of wants that. And they're interested in what techniques or secrets you had in getting that done. What worked for you, what didn't. Um, so it's a good human thing that, that Elon did. But Elon did not get into the specifics of his condition. And just because you said out loud, let me just change the subject. Let's Because he's actually talking about psychological struggles. So let's just change the subject a little bit. If you had disclosed at some point you had been raped, if a woman had disclosed that she had been raped, it would have been wrong for Don Lemon to sit across from them and said, well, you were raped, right? Here's, if you want to handle this situation gracefully, because uh, I think all the questions that he got into about dosing and all the rest of it, and it this sub segment goes on, by the way, in, into uh, uh, how much this affects, should he be the CEO of a major company if yes. he's got depression? Like, holy cow, like, this is this is Don Lemon getting fired from CNN, where he suggested that women were not in their prime after their birth giving years. They they move out of their prime, and and that, that was the final straw after several straws that broke the C CNN's back. And they said, "You got to go." Um, this is the same thing. He's implying that because Elon is taking ketamine and has smoked some marijuana in the past, that ergo he's not fit or qualified. Stockholders, Wall Street should be scared of him. That's where this actually ends up going. Um, but the the even getting into these little bits of things about your dosing and your which he continues to do uh, beyond the segment clip we played, this is too personal. But Elon still goes ahead because he's not thin skinned, and he does answer the question even though he is tells Don this was all you shouldn't have done this. So I want to tell you the gracious way of going about this because I don't think the question itself is illegitimate. Yeah, it seems like a reasonable question. It's a reasonable question if it's handled properly. Yes, that's the if. And the, the the Elon's instant reaction tells me it wasn't handled properly. So here's how you do it. And this is, again, assuming that you actually like or respect the person that you're sitting across from. This is a piece of evidence that Don does it. You would say to him, you wouldn't surprise him with that question. There might be other things you choose to surprise him with, but you wouldn't surprise that question because it's not, this has to do with your personal life, not your public life. And so what you would do in this particular situation is you would say, listen, um, Elon, I think you uh, have really done a huge public service. You've shared with everybody what you think. And maybe there's some concerns out there. Maybe people don't fully understand you. Uh, can we go into this area and maybe even discuss a little bit more specifically why you're doing what you're doing uh, and share with people so that maybe people feel a greater sense of confidence and and maybe even you could address some lingering questions that are out there about about this issue. Now, Elon could say no and that means you're not going to get to answer, ask the question during the course of the interview. So that's the risk that you take in being a decent human being at that moment. Of of thinking of someone else, of not being totally obsessed with your own ratings. And privately, um Bill you have seen me do this with guests. You've at, you've seen me ask if we can go a certain place or if they're comfortable with a certain thing. And if we get into something that's a little more difficult, that's what I'm going to continue to do. Like, I don't want to spring on somebody something about their personal life. I don't, right. Depression should not be the basis of a gotcha question. I um, like that he handled it the way he did. My respect points for Elon went up in this segment. Yeah, and it 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 undermines the hypothesis that he's a thin-skinned billionaire that can't take a tough question. Exactly. Now, we're not going to play the clip or cover it because there's no way to do this in a constructive manner. We would have to play a significant part of the show, and the link to Don Lemon's show uh, uh, is in, in case you don't believe I'm portraying things correctly. Uh, you can check me out. Uh, by going and watching it. I'm going to tell you that it's starting at the 23rd minute of this discussion. 23 minutes in now. It's an hour and what, five or six minutes? Yeah, yeah. hour six. Uh, in in the 23rd minute, uh, the great replacement theory gets raised. For those of you that don't know what the great replacement theory is, it's an idea that some group of people 
Uh, this is an, an anti-Semitic trope, but it can be applied in a variety of different ways. Some group of people are coming in and taking over and seeking to change our way of life. They are interlopers. They are intruders. They are invaders who are coming in to take over our way of life. And they will fundamentally change the character of everything. And in the worst possible case, they will actually destroy us. And um, this is a theme that he will wind through a significant portion of the next 30 plus minutes in the interview. And it starts off with a discussion in this particular case of a tweet that had to do with illegal immigration. Now, I don't agree with uh, what Elon was positing. I actually think this is one of the few times Don argues with him and has his facts a little better than Elon does. But on the flip side of this, Elon makes a really incredible point in the course of this discussion. And I'm not going to play his clip or how it was set up because he repeats the point. I'm going to just say it out, out flat out. And about it's about conspiracies because we've been dealing with conspiracy and we're going to be dealing with more with conspiracy as the show goes forward. I mean, even this episode is about how to watch or understand or consume media, but we're going to do, because I think that's part of what you need to learn how to be graceful. I think the conflict machine gins stuff up and gets us at each other's throats. So I want to suggest that you need to understand this stuff, but understanding conspiracy is important too. What is a real conspiracy and not a conspiracy? We've already dealt with some of these issues in this program. We did three episodes about that. We got more. Up, uh, we talked about a false flag conspiracy now, uh, the, a very big one that happened in all of our lifetime here. Uh, so we're going to get into some more about that as we go. But a conspiracy by definition is people plotting together. They, they, they planned, they engineered, they wanted the outcome to happen. And you see people lazily resorting to this every time their political opponents do something that they don't like. And Elon makes an important point, and that is that one doesn't need to be a conspiracy theorist when they can demonstrate an overwhelming incentive is at work. If everybody's being pulled gravitationally towards a, uh, a particular behavior, we can look at the incentive and and we don't there has doesn't have to be any coordination. It's the invisible hand, literally at work, moving everybody. It's the incentive that's driving them. It's not a conspiracy. Yeah. I thought that was a very very solid point. And given that we've touched on that so much in this show, I wanted to make sure that I pointed it out here. All right, I'm going to really challenge you now, Bill, because we have two clips, and I want to play them in a row with a gap in between to say so their audience doesn't have to go through the whole thing. Uh, so could you play both clips G and H? I'm talking about the great replacement theory is also part of a Jewish conspiracy theory. And when you did the tweet or you responded to the tweet about that, you ended up apologizing. And which I think is, you know, it's good that you ended up apologizing. You went to Auschwitz with Ben Shapiro. Yeah. Right? So you said you learned your lesson. What did you learn? I said I learned my lesson. You said you learned your lesson when, it, when you apologized and you said you went to Auschwitz. You saw what... what... No, I was already, already aware of, of, of these things. And the nature of my comment that, that really inflamed people, um, what, I was, what I was trying to say, and I did very quickly clarify, this is what I'm saying, is that uh, um, a number of uh, prominent uh, Jewish philanthropists fund uh, groups that they should really take a closer look at funding because some of the, some of the groups they fund, um, I think, are anti-Semitic. And then we got a second clip. It is a, a neo-Nazi trope. It's in the neo-Nazi manifesto. It's in the Turner Diaries. It's referenced by the Buffalo mass shooter uh, in his manifesto where 10 people, um, black people were murdered in Buffalo. His actual title is a Christchurch shooter's manifesto. 51 people in the Muslim mosque were murdered. 23 people uh, murdered in El Paso by a shooter who used the same language that you use in that manifesto when you say Hispanic invasion. Is that not? I didn't say an Hispanic invasion. And when are you going to stop beating your wife? And let me list all the other times that everyone in the other history of the world has ever beat their wife and hold you responsible for those too. Because, you know, don't you know from their example how bad you are? What an awful person you are? Uh, you know, I know you said you apologize, which, by the way, you seem to be denying now. Uh, I know you walk through Auschwitz, but you know, you, you really continue to a trope. Um, you're you're a bad person. I, I mean, I, I can't believe how bad you are. You, 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 I'm going to associate you with all these things and really lay it on thick how bad an awful person you are. Did you just not understand? 
the, it's by this take point, a while, but you know, he's going to Elon's going to come back and say, "Stop putting words in my mouth." It's at one point here, but this yeah, is where he it eventually will. He eventually will. And I thought I saw Elon starting to get it at this point, and it turned out he continued to defer. He continued to play along. But there was a there was a moment during this phase of the interview where I thought, okay, all right, he sees what's happening now. He's got it. Uh, but he didn't. Uh, he keeps going. Uh, uh, Don does just enough stuff to keep the confidence going, keep it rolling, um, and t- and and take advantage of normal human good nature. Not Elon's normal. I'm just talking in general how people handle things. We try to defer and see the best in others, even when we're starting to be attacked. Um, unless we're paranoid. Uh, and, and I don't think Elon's demonstrating any paranoia here. It would be warranted. He, he demonstrated paranoia when he took over Twitter. And I, it turned out that was warranted. So I, 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 think, uh, I think he's showing some, some deference at this point. Um, but Don does, again, this is another instance of Don doesn't like him. He's just showing off to his friends. And, and I, I say here, I just want people to understand at this point in time, the, the great replacement anti-Semitism stuff has been going on for nearly four minutes. It's nowhere near done. Let's go to the next clip. Do you think if there, if, if you moderated yourself more, if there was better content moderation on the platform that you wouldn't have to answer these questions from reporters about the great, great replacement theory as it relates? I don't to have to answer this question. Great replacement theory as it relates to Jewish people. Do you think that? I don't have to answer questions from reporters. Don, the only reason I'm doing this interview is because you're on the X platform and you asked for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, I would not do interview with this interview. So you don't think, you, do you think that you wouldn't get in trouble or you wouldn't be criticized for these things? I'm or criticized that there possibly. Was... I could care less. It, you, don't, you don't care? No, I don't Why care. Why not? I don't think people should care what the media thinks about them. They're he... terrible judges of character. They are terrible judges of character. So... I want to lay out Lemon's philosophy here. I just want to sum it up in one line, and that is that censorship is respect for the truth. If you respect the truth, you censor. You shut down people who do not speak the truth. Now, unfortunately, the truth is multi-layered, impossible for most of us because we see through a glass darkly to completely see at all uh, at all times. Uh, there's new information that maybe we're not aware of, and that includes Don Lemon, the erudite Don Lemon. There's things that he and his cast don't understand or know or relate to. Um, and it's kind of counter to how truth works. So this is not an insignificant point that Community Notes is being brought up. Community Notes is the right way to deal with the problem. It crowdsources truth. So everybody's able to come in and speak in the public square. And some voices will elevate because it's obvious that they bring more benefit. They bring more reality. Now, that doesn't mean that the fact that other voices are expressed isn't going to attract some group of nuts. Cults, for example, exist for a reason, right? Um, People vote Democrat for a reason. Like, I I don't... Okay, I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) We should say... People vote libertarian for a reason. (laughs) Okay. So, you know, everybody's got their thing that they do, right? Yep. And it doesn't, I, 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 my point, all kidding aside, is that none of us have the complete truth. I'm hesitant to come on and talk about some subjects here because I know that they're nuanced and multi-layered and the amount of time that it would take to get up the, the ramp is high. I have yep. been spending one particular time on one particular topic that we've not brought on this show yet. Uh, I have spent hundreds of hours on it already. Um because it's that complicated and you can't, no human being can do this on everything. And this, the, the, the CNN newsroom who's about ratings and getting stuff out the door can't do it either. So even if he brings in, you know, uh, um, Zucker and, and all the rest of the people that used to work with him that he's trying to impress here, Don and his, his best friends can't do this alone. So Elon is saying, he goes on to explain quite a bit that if we put uh, this out to everybody, they can all comment on this video. And they will comment on this video. And they will make derivative products like we're doing of this video. And there will be lots of different ways thought of for people to pull this thing apart and question both of us. And that's what Community Notes does on Axe. It really is a brilliant idea. 
and it really is a gracious idea that you allow the speech to occur, but you allow a correction to show up that is put in place by the crowd, not by some central arbiter who is corruptible, but by a variety of amateurs who are sitting out in the field who go, wait a minute, I can't believe he said that. And by the way, it could be experts too, but their voice is equal and there's a process for making sure that the alternative information can be provided. Yes. And Elon goes so far as to say, this process has been used on me repeatedly. I put stuff out and people have used community notes. So even I am not above this process. But Don just wants censorship. We'll yeah. come back to some more of that later. Uh, where I want to go now is I want to do uh, clip J, if we could, please. You recently called content moderation, though, a digital chastity belt. Do you think that you, you believe that X and you have some responsibility to moderate hate speech on the platform? I think we have a responsibility to adhere to the law and we have a responsibility to be transparent uh, about when things are shown, why they're shown. Uh, so we, that's why we, we uh, open source our algorithm. Um, the, I think once you start getting going beyond the law, now you're putting your thumb on the scale. And we don't want to put out that on the scale. It doesn't concern you that hate speech has gone. Research shows that it's gone up on the platform since you took over. That's not concerning to you? I believe that is false. In fact, the research that I've seen says it, go, it went down. The, the study from the Institute of Strategic Dialogue found that anti-Semitic tweets doubled from June 22 to February 2023. One study reported that as many as 86% of the posts reported for hateful content remained up after being reported. Hate speech on the platform is up. Uh, so what, what they will typically do is they will count the number of posts, but not count the number of views. So what matters is, was that uh, post given high visibility or what did, did like one person see it? Uh, and if you look at the number of views of how, 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 many, how many times was hate content viewed on our platform, it is down substantially. Yeah. Well, that's not was what the study shows. And you said you like transparency. I'm going to show you this. And, and Don, you can get a study that will tell you whatever you want. But this, this, this is, these are just a handful of extremely, you look at those anti-Semitic and racist tropes and tweets. And as of this morning, they're still on X. And from your own content policy, these posts should have been deleted. So why haven't they been deleted? Why are they still there? Did you... uh, we delete things if they are illegal. But these have been up there for a while. Are they illegal? Uh, no, they're not illegal, but they're hateful and they can they can lead to violence. As I just read to you, the shooters, you know, in all of these mass shootings, attributed social media to radicalizing. So, so Don, you love censorship, is what you're saying? No, I don't love censorship. Then why why are you asking? I believe in moderation. Moderation is a propaganda word for censorship. He's 100 percent right. Moderation equals censorship. That's the way the platform works. And there's been this fallacious argument we're not going to go into today that private platforms can do this and whatever. What I want to say here is that I think both guys are wrong. Uh, Elon is less wrong uh, by, a, by a mile. Um, uh, I, I don't think in Elon's case it's sufficient to just follow the law. And we also know that in foreign countries, uh, Twitter has not been as resistant as it was uh, during the Jack Dorsey era in foreign countries to the censorship that was attempted to be applied there. Now, maybe that doesn't matter as much to us as Americans, but uh, Elon's follow the law is a great rule for the United States. It goes most of where of the way that it should go, and that is that it's not going to ban something from being on the platform uh, that doesn't conform with the law. And the law here happens to be most of the time, there are uh, weird exceptions made to this, it happens to be the First Amendment which says that Congress shall make no law. There are some weird exceptions, and there's a case in the Supreme Court, the Murthy uh, case, which uh, we, my organization, DC.org and Downsize DC Foundation, filed an amicus brief in um, uh, that has to do with internet censorship and the, the links that the government went to in that case. Uh, I don't expect the Supreme Court to do 100% the right thing. I think that they're going to lean the right way, but I think they're going to try to carve out some emergency certain types of powers for certain things at certain times and done in certain ways going forward. That's not the First Amendment. So if Elon was following the First Amendment gospel, that would be um, that would be really good. Not perfect, but really good. Um, Can I ask Lemon, you a question about this? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to interrupt your train of thought, but... No, you're fine. 
I don't see either of them making a distinction between journalism and free speech. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. So journalism d derives from free press, which is the ability to publish. Right. And every one of us has a press right. And uh, did you, I don't know if you've picked up on the irony of this entire thing. Yes, the that's part of why I'm asking the question. <laughs> okay, no, no, because there's a there's a there's a tremendous irony. It's a visual. Don Lemon publishes the very things that he says Elon should have banned. Those images were put on the screen. He didn't just tell them they existed. He's like, well, you've let this kind of stuff get, and they were of a certain kind. They were anti-Semitic. Yep, uh, blatantly anti-Semitic. Um, and so Don is putting that stuff up on the screen while he's telling Elon, you shouldn't put this stuff on your platform. And Don's I can doing do it for, for fun and profit. He's Don's clearly doing it. Yeah, it benefits the, the, Don's show. Elon yes. did not post this stuff. Don yes. posted it. Elon did not. That's okay. Good. I'm glad you pointed that out because I did that's another layer of it that I didn't think about. It's crazy. Okay. So, and then you know, it's interesting because Lemon says, Well, you restrict some things, you restrict child porn. Well, that's consistent with Elon's standard about the law. As of right now, the law says that child porn can't be posted, so they do cooperate in, tr in trying not only to keep that stuff off the platform, removing it when it's spotted, and cooperating with authorities. They do all of those steps because that's the current law, okay? Um, if a law was made, however, to ban political speech of any kind, if the, if the Supreme Court doesn't go as far as it should in this particular case, I don't think the law should be the bottom line. I think the law should be one of those standards, but I think you should have certain cases where you say, no, we're going to go further. So let me tell you where I would go, okay? Because I believe in grace. And so for me, you let the expression occur and then you see where it goes. But you also make sure that it's possible for everyone to respond and set uh, a given point of view straight. And I believe that part of why we were at each other's throats so much is that we start to personalize these things instead of focus on what the actual issue is. The, con the community notes we talked about before, this was focusing on the issue. So there's a gracious way to handle that matter. And I actually think community notes is better than the First Amendment. Does that make sense? No, it, it totally does. Because you get to see in real time how people are treating their responsibility for, for free speech. Like okay. out in the open, in the wild, you get to watch it happening. Yes. Okay. Now there's another way that Elon's wrong and he doesn't say this out loud. It's almost, and Don, the fact that Don didn't pick up on this proves that Don doesn't understand what censorship is. The high visibility stuff that Elon's mentioning, what he's mentioning is we have a shadow banning process in place. And I actually think shadow banning is worse than outright censorship. Okay. Listen, if you hate my guts, please tell me to my face. Yeah, just say so. Don't go all passive aggressive on me. Don't start doing stuff behind my back. Tell me what you think of me. Let me know where we stand with one another. Okay. The real human thing to do, the real good humane thing to do is to be honest and enough to say, I don't like what you just did, or I don't even like the cut of your jib. I, you're, you're, why do you do this? Yeah. That's honest. When people go passive aggressive, when they, sh when they, sh when they, uh, ghost someone, you just tell people. And so like on this show, we've had a couple of episodes, a couple of them, where we've wondered whether or not we had gotten shadow banned. Um, I would rather the platform came and told us flat out, you're in trouble yep. with us. Yep. Here's what I would said, rather here's know. Why. Okay. Because yep. I can disagree with the rules, but I can, or I can figure out how to play around them. Right. But I would like to know. So uh, finally, this whole hate speech thing, we got to put this to bed. Um, it's a stupid argument that people using rhetoric are responsible for others who use violence. I'm not, I, I, I have moral accountability and responsibility for myself. And yes, there is such a thing as incitement, but it's really difficult to prove. And you have to have proximity and some other things in place. This happens far too much where it's a form of straw man argument where we demonize somebody because one person ex behaved extremely bad. And it's done repeatedly on a variety of subjects by, by all sides in the political debate. One person behaves badly. In fact, this is the shock that's normally delivered uh, to everybody's nerves is that we pick the most extreme case and we say that represents all of you. This is what I think of all of you. 
And I think this is what leads to our coercion, our violence. And it keeps getting worse. I think that that's the problem, is that we're constantly picking that stuff out and we're elevating that stuff. We should be discussing ideas. And we should not ever, it's wrong, it's ungracious to be holding people responsible for the worst behavior of the worst actors inside a given point of view. Um, and as a result, the, the next thing that happens in this process is that we don't learn anything. So nobody's moral character is ever approved, including the people who made who who make these remarks. We're not actually dialoguing with them. We're just demonizing them. And given the fact that we're in the conflict machine, that political coercion is at work, uh, this, this winning becomes everything. So the issue itself even disappears. All we want is to defeat the other side and see them cry. And I, 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 there's, I love the phrase digital chastity belt. I think that's, you know, Elon has issued some really colorful statements over the years. Um, but I don't think follow the law is enough. I don't think we should be suppressing or shadow banning people. Uh, I think we have to hear people out. And some ugly stuff is going to come to the surface as a result of this. Um, in a public forum, that's what should happen. In a public forum, in the open civic spaces, we shouldn't be restricting people's ability to move or speak. Um, now, proving that Don Lemon didn't get it, let's play the next clip, please. But everyone has the opportunity okay. to read it, Elon. I think they, they you don't have the opportunity to read the internet. Are you that suggesting we should shut down the internet? No, but, but you don't own the internet. I'm asking you about you and your responsibility and your platform. And I, I, so I see how you feel now. You don't agree. We don't agree on this. Yes, you want censorship and I don't. No, I don't want censorship at yes, all. Yes, you do. No, I want responsibility. I think there is, I think there... You desperately want censorship. No, if I want a censorship... You want censorship so bad you can taste it. No, that's not true. <laughs> it's not true. I think that there's right and wrong. And, and I think that, that says it. and I, this is the first time, by the way, that Elon is finally striking back. We're 38 minutes into the interview. It's the very first time he's actually striking back. Yep. Some guy under his collar, man. Yeah. And he does it with a smile. Uh, but, uh, content moderation is censorship. All right. Uh, next clip, please. What evidence do you have though, that they're lowering the standards? I, there is no evidence of that. Well, I your, believe there is. There's no evidence of that, Elon. What what is the evidence? I, I believe they have literally lowered the standards at, at Duke University, and that is what the article is referring to. There's no you evidence. They have that. not lowered there's, the standards. There's no Duke? evidence about uh, lowering standards, and I think that there is. Um, I believe that is a false statement you're making. Okay, well we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, I, I think I mean, the interesting thing is when this is posted on the X platform, there will be a whole bunch of things that rebut what you said and what what I said, right. and so people can then make their own decision based on the replies the rebuttals and the community notes. And and I happen to agree with this. Uh, this last point that Elon's making, I put this clip in front of you because it underscores the community notes idea. This is a, a mindset. Um, people will pick apart the interview. They will make derivative product like we're doing here. And they'll start in the comments, but they'll publish other stuff elsewhere. And this is consistent. This is the American way of thinking. This is the, this is the founder's way of thinking. Uh, in Federalist 10, James Madison said that he was dealing with the problem of faction, or what today we would call political parties. It was not perceived at the time to be a good thing that we would have these parties. And I think history has shown it's not really a great thing that we have them. Um, but uh, so-called content moderation is inferior to real-time discussion, the crowd coming in and sourcing and dealing with the problem. So the way that you want to approach this, if you want to be a good, gracious person, is First, you have an open mind, right? You don't necessarily accept what either one of these guys is saying. And you would actually, if you really wanted to understand what was being said, rather than knee-jerkingly jump off and agree with either one of them, you would start to look in their comments sections. Right. Or you right. would do Wouldn't some you? other research. Yeah. Would it be normal? Um, not all the content is going to be good, especially on a place like YouTube. Just want to say, YouTube comments by and large, and there's reasons for that. But what you're looking for is the real, the people that seem to be showing some intellectual heft. They're yes. probably even willing to share with you a link, a source for their way of thinking, and and they'll and they'll help you find things. So I have this this technique I like to use. I've been using it for a couple decades now. If I can get two people that I like, who may have never met each other before, who are on different sides of an issue, together on a conversation on the phone, or even better over a dinner table, 
and start a debate between the two of them. And I can sit back and watch the fireworks. And I don't mean this in a bad way because it turns out that when people meet, they, they have me in common. And when they meet each other this way, they don't shoot each other. They end up actually sharing their best arguments and they're deferential and kind to one another 99% of the time. Just because they have you in common? Uh, yes, and because they're they're communicating directly as Got one person. Yes. There's no yes. audience other right. than me. I'm the yes. best audience. I'm the only audience. It's not, they don't have to impress a crowd. They don't have to worry about this going viral. They can actually just be a human being for a moment. Yeah. And in those particular settings, I learn a lot. I learn a lot. I'm not, I'm sitting here today in part because of a conversation that occurred over my dinner table in 2002 timeframe between two people who disagreed. And I had invited one person kind of to set the other straight a little bit. But that person ended up saying something that I thought undermined our entire argument. And I had to call him after the night was over, you know, a day or two later and be like, wait a minute, what were you doing? Yeah, yeah. And that started me on a journey that is part of why I'm here now. Okay. So it ended up, I ended up being changed by the experience because I was consuming two people who knew what they were talking about, it's conversation. And Two people who, by the way, didn't leave disagreeing with their previous position, but I was transformed by it. And we yep. should be open-minded enough to want to be transformed by truth. There we go. That is that is the soundbite for this entire episode. We should be open-minded enough that we can be transformed by truth. We want to be. We want to be. Ultimately, we want to. Yes, we want. Yes. That's mimetic. Okay, so now... I don't have a clip for this next thing, but there was a prolonged discussion of DEI standards. Oh, and, yes. And uh, they, uh, Boeing Airlines troubles were briefly brought up in the midst of this, and that's becoming a big issue, by the way. That's a story to watch. Um, this is another one of those cases, and I want to be balanced and fair here that Elon is in the wrong. DEI is not what's happening at Boeing. This the DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. That is not why Boeing is suffering the problems it's suffering. This is, uh, 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 unfortunately, um, I'm concerned that Americans may end up getting killed, as some others have, by Boeing's failures. Um, the, the, it's a very, very dangerous position that that they're in, we're in. Um, but those failures appear to have been the result of a quarter century of increased corruption. And it's the type of thing that publicly traded companies are uniquely incentivized to engage in. Um, at some point, maybe we need to discuss the morality of corporations. Uh, we're not going to get into that today. But it is not the case that um, the DEI is what is responsible for Boeing. Um, but that didn't stop uh, Don. What he really wanted to set up was the fact, because he's, again, this is part, even though you don't realize it, you know, a lot of time has passed in this interview. And as I said, I ultimately counted over 31 minutes of this. Um, he's still trying to demonstrate that Elon's a bigot. So he wants to use this to enter into the fact that uh, there is an EEOC the Equal Employment Opportunity Com Commission uh, versus Tesla lawsuit. And this got into a discussion of how anti-woke Elon is on the issue of transgender. And by this point in the interview, I think there's some things that should be obvious. And th the biggest of those is that every single thing that Don has brought up is a progressive talk, not only a progressive talking point, it's a progressive grinding point. It's a progressive ax grinding point. Like this is, there's nothing that he's brought up that shows that he's independent, centrist, moderate, slight bit conservative. None of that's been brought up. It is all secular progressivism of the kind that is part of the CNN ideology. He is entirely in CNN ideological mode. He fits over there. I mean, CNN fit him like a glove, and he misses it. There is a philosophy that's at work over there, that there are authorities who are, should be making all the rules, deciding everything for your life because they know better. And uh, I have said uh, about CNN, you know, that you, everybody has Fox is the Republican side and MSNBC is the Democrat side. But the truth about CNN has always been that there's the CIA side. It's the CIA news network. It is the deep state network. It is the, it is the network where they are trying to tell you that there are people who are better than you who should be in charge. Yeah. And, and we happen to know who those people are. They're our friends. We go to cocktail parties with them. Um. And so this will last for 31 minutes, 31 minutes, quick story. I don't think that you have to put up with somebody. It makes you anti first amendment or anti censorship as Don Lemon will claim of Elon. 
when they have behaved badly in your home. There's a, there's a line that's crossed between asking a tough question and really trying to guilt by association, uh, use tactics employees, uh, all designed to make me look like a rotten, terrible, horrible human being. You're, you're past the point of asking tough questions now. You are, you're, you're really piling on in a way that... Uh, and it's completely like on, on, you know, by surprise. And I had a situation where I knew somebody in terrestrial space who every time I saw him acted like he was, couldn't have been happier to see me. And I don't know, maybe that was sincere. Uh, we had encountered each other uh, through a setting that I was a, a safe space for me. It was a place where I didn't expect politics to come up, but he kept pushing to have political discussions with me. And it turned out he was a communist. And, and I, I, I just told him in some cases, listen, when we're together here and we're in this doing this particular activity that we happen to both enjoy, th this isn't what I want to do. I don't want to debate you. Like I do this at my day job and maybe some night you can buy me dinner and I'll give you everything you want, but I'd rather not do this here. So he started showing up in my social media feed and he didn't just show up in my social media feed. He started behaving really badly. Um, he started causing fights with people in my comment section. He started engaging in rude behavior and, uh, and then he got personal. He started talking about a decision that my family had made to try to tell everybody how, what a big hypocrite I was. And it started to dawn on me, Bill, this dude doesn't like me, but I wasn't going to do anything further except say, listen, I want you to behave nicer in my comment section, what you're doing right now. And this had happened more than once, what you're doing right now. I, I, I need to ask you to stop. What I like to have is respectful, healthy discussion. You can disagree with me. You can even tell everybody you think I'm wrong, or you can even expose my hypocrisy, but you need to be nicer. Yeah. And he told me I was arrogant and he couldn't believe it. And he said I was full of myself and whatever. And so I sent him away. We have no yeah. further contact with each other. Zero. It's, it's, I'm blessed that he lives in another state now. And if he's watching the show, he'll know exactly who he is. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me, by the way, if you tuned into these shows. It wouldn't surprise me because he seemed a little obsessed, to be honest. And and it made me feel really bad, just to be clear, because I thought this guy liked me. Yeah, yeah. And I'm imagining Elon's shocked and surprised at this point. And this is he's starting to to, to bite back, but um, it's 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 this is behavior that is clear to me that he doesn't like Elon. And he's much more interested in the opinion of his former associates. Um, then came up the subject of advertisers who leave. Um, Elon has famously said that they can go F themselves. Yep. I don't want to play the clip because of the profanity that was associated with it. We would get marked for that. Um, but I do want to start with Elon here. We've got clip M. If they're going to force censorship on the, on the company uh, before advertising, then... Uh, obviously, I find that unacceptable. You find it unacceptable. Why is that not a form of, of free speech? They are free to advertise where they want. They're not beholden to, they're not yes. obligated to advertise they're not on obligated. the next account. Right. So, how is that not free speech? So they, they, that's, whereas the other platforms will censor on behalf of, of advertisers, the X platform will not. Okay. So, but you think it's uh, you don't think it's okay for them not to advertise with or have their content or their advertisement next to something that is anti-Semitic or that is a different question. Uh, you, you we, we there's there's you can absolutely choose where next to which content do you want to advertise into a beer. Absolutely, of course. And we do, we have, I think, very good ad placement controls in this regard. So, so you don't, he did try to mix two issues there. And I think that Elon uh, properly separated those things and had a good answer for him. Uh, the, the advertisement is not for Twitter, just like your advertisement on a TV program isn't for all of television or your advertisement on the internet isn't for all the internet. And uh, this is a to me. This is a significant point. You are able to pick, and the platform has made sure, and the market drives them in this direction to make sure that they are not putting their ad next to content that they would find personally objectionable. 
Um, and a lot of the people have come back, not all, but many, many, uh, um, of the people who walked away have now snuck back in through the back door kind of quietly and they're back on Twitter. They, they, their, their grandstanding moment is over. Um, they've accepted that they maybe need access to this platform, which seems to be enjoying a renewed bit of vibrancy. Um, I don't use Twitter at present. I'm not saying I won't, but at the, the moment I don't really use it. Um, I don't particularly care for the interface or the way it interacts. I'm really sad and depressed that Facebook has fallen so hard because I did enjoy Facebook up until 2021. Uh, it's meta era has to me been, been awful. Um, but Elon bought Twitter and he says this out loud for the free speech. And I actually think the incident that motivated him was the Babylon B getting banned. Uh, he, he appreciated the Babylon B thought they were funny and the regime didn't even have a sense of humor. They wouldn't allow satire on. They treated satire as misinformation. And um, because they think people are stupid. So at the end of the day, if you make these arguments about censorship and you say that I am committed to truth and we need to keep certain content off, it's because you believe that people are so easily led around and stupid. And this is completely consistent with the CNN ideology that, that we have experts and we know better. Right, yeah. Because the flip side of that coin is you're too stupid. You're too stupid to know what you're doing. And you're led around by the nose. And in fact, we know we have agenda setting uh, at work. You'll talk about the things that we put at the top of the feed. You will actually respond viscerally uh, with adrenaline, fear, uh, anger, whatever. We know we can lead you around by the nose to some degree. And since we believe this about you, we have a very low opinion of you. We don't think you could think for yourself. And, but the real test we have for this is that you don't agree with us. You don't share our biases. You don't share our perspectives. You don't share our bigotries. You don't share our views. You don't uh, respond and react in the same way that we do to a given thing. You don't have the state and big business at the core of your very philosophy and belief. Um, you don't have certain sexual views that we have. Like We understand that you are, f are flawed because you're doing things like clinging to your guns or your Bibles, or you don't understand why corporations need to be able to pollute the way that they do. Like We understand that. Uh, you're inferior to us. You're too stupid. And so this is the CNN ideology. And Don Lemon is out of CNN will not have a job at CNN. And all he cares about is continuing to sing from that hymn book. Now, the next part and the last clip we're going to play is the best question and answer of the entire segment of the entire interview, in my humble opinion. Lemon asks Elon about his legacy. And there's been a lot of interest in Elon. And for my money, if you're looking for a short encapsulation of who he's trying to be, watch this clip. If I died knowing that I, that I did what was right or, or did my best to do what was right, and even if in the history books they said I did, did wrong, I would still feel okay about that. I care about the reality of goodness, not the perception of it. Um, I think we should view civilization uh, as tenuous, as fragile. Um, if, you, if you do study history broadly, you'll see that there's a rise and fall to civilizations. They don't always go up. Um, so we should do everything we possibly can to preserve uh, and, and extend civilization as we know it, yeah. um, and improve it, um, to become more enlightened over time. And we, uh, therefore want to address civilizational risks. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, we don't have, for example, demographic collapse, which, which is the case in a lot of countries, uh, just very low birth rate. Um, we, we want to avoid, obviously avoid world war three, anything that is a civilizational risk. That's what I care about. Civilizational risks. Um, how do we extend? consciousness into the future such that we are able to better understand the, the nature of reality. Yeah. That's what I care about. That's my motivation. I love the line, the reality of goodness, not the perception of it. First of all, I just want to say, I, I think you have to be willing to be criticized. This is another aspect of being gracious. You have to be willing to be criticized. You have to know when it's constructive. And that's something that you have to derive from, from your own spiritual grounding, from having done your homework in many cases. Um, and you have to continue to do the right thing regardless of circumstances. 
And in the previous episode that we did, uh, where we talked about the truth about war, you get a death threat. Knowing that you're doing something right, having people accuse you of being nuts because the whole world is going one direction. You're saying, no, I'm sorry. I know this is wrong. It's great when you're proved out later. But acting from faith, being a person of faith, is sticking to the principles even when all the tide's running the other direction. And it's amazing how often people are vindicated. And sometimes it, it happens quick. More often than not, it takes a long time. And by the time it happens, nobody cares. And then if you're in somebody in the position like, let's say, Martin Luther King was on desegregation, uh, nobody will, t- will you'll get killed for it. Nobody will take you, you'll be resisted and hated while you live. And then you will be misused by the people who would have opposed you as a token of their values. Like, it, this is how you get used and abused. This is what happens to prophets. They stone them. So it's important to be open to doing the right thing. The reality of goodness, not the perception of it, but in other people's eyes is what matters. And I couldn't agree with Elon about that more. I think that's a gracious point. But what why he's making the things that he makes, SpaceX, Tesla, um, he's doing stuff to help people who are uh, quadriplegic and paraplegic. Uh, why he's making the products he's making uh, is why he expresses the opinions he does. And I want to suggest to you that there's this thing in life where oftentimes somebody's greatest strengths are also the things that maybe in your perception are their greatest weaknesses. They wouldn't be who they were in, in the places that you dislike. You would, you would lose or lack the things that you love. And it wasn't that long ago that the left loved Tesla. In fact, it was a left-wing identity. And um, Elon himself, in, you know, 2015 Elon, for example, was on the political left. So we, he's been kind of pushed out of that camp in some ways, or it's moved on him. Uh, but he didn't make the choice to make uh, Tesla in, in reality because he was a progressive. He kind of ended up associating with them because they're the ones that got and understood what he was doing with the car first. And but make and and, and so I'm suggesting to you the things that drove him were these attitudes that he's expressing right here. That he really does believe in going out into the market and trying to make the world proactively, engaging, innovating, making the world a better place. And he's working, he explains in the interview, and he does this elsewhere as well. But he's working 16-hour days in many cases. It's not uncommon. For him to do a 16 hour day. And it's not uncommon for him to be working on Saturday and Sunday. When he was building Tesla, he told Don Lemon during the course of this interview, he lived in the plant for days at a time. He just didn't, he didn't even go home. And his story at PayPal and how he and Peter Thiel ended up meeting has everything to do with the fact that the dude was absolutely Thiel knew that this competitor down the street, we got to get together with this guy because this guy can compete. He works really hard. Um, and he encourages people to work around him. I happen to have a colleague whose daughter works in Twitter for Elon and says it's a high-paced, uh, uh, high-expectation environment. And if you're competitive and you want to do good work, you thrive there. Um, so I can see that he's into in market innovation, which to me is the most gracious way, not coercion, not government force, to get things done. So you want to solve the problem and you want people to get in electric cars, you do it through the market. You don't impose re- regulation to make it happen. You, you you make your case, and then you make a product that makes it easy for people to go along with it. This is the real way to change the world, and Elon's doing it. He's kind of the exemplar in a lot of ways and model. He's not Jesus Christ. He's not God. He's not a perfect person. I, I can imagine, by the way, he might even be hard to work for or at times to put up with, right? Um, a lot of times people as driven as him are, but... Yeah. He's doing the right thing in the world, and I think he's done a, a, a good job. Now, as for Don, as for Don Lemon, I feel bad that this is his view of the world. And that's, you know, there, I, 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 in a way, there was a hope that getting fired from CNN might be a wake-up call, that this is not a healthy view of the world. And not a healthy view of your fellow man. Um, to subscribe to the CNN ideology that there are experts who are better than the rest of us, and that we all should be subjected to them. We shouldn't go through our own growth and spiritual transformation process. Is not a beautiful view of the world. 
seems to me to be the opposite. And I don't think he exhibited grace in this interview. I think he was trying to sabotage a relationship right in front of people that had been graciously offered to him. You could say it was offered to him for commercial reasons. Elon was commercially motivated. Of course he was. But Elon didn't realize how bad Don Lemon disliked and maybe even hated him. Enough that he was willing to walk away for more than $10 million and go appeal to the people that he used to work for. I want you to think about that for a second. Just think about that. You've been fired from a job that you were at for a long time. You feel you did a good job and your firing is unjust. Do you go to your next job, perhaps at a competitor, and sabotage a relationship at your next job? Destroy your opportunity at that next job just to prove to the old employer that they shouldn't have fired you in the first place? Just to stay in their good graces? Who would do that if they weren't extraordinarily motivated by a philosophy that they believe is at the core of their being? I don't actually think that the people who come on CNN every night are necessarily bad people. In fact, they're probably fine people in a lot of ways. But I want you to understand that they're not just doing what they're doing because they are in a conspiracy. They really believe what they're saying. They want to advance the cause that they're a part of. It's not just the money for them. It wasn't just the money for Don Lemon. He really does have this low view of his fellow man and this low view of Elon Musk.